Good morning, Gateway. Let's all rise and give God the praise. Oh, let your glory pour out, Jesus. We welcome you in this place. We will rejoice. Let's do this together, Gateway. Come on. Hallelujah. So clap our hands. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. There's a light that shines with hope and grace fills the sky. With your mercy each day we're alive. Let your glory pour out, Jesus. That's it. There's a joy that overwhelms our souls because we know our God is in control of our
Come on, Gateway, give you praise. Oh, give him a shout of victory. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. What a wonderful worship encounter again, Gateway. Thank you for worshiping with us. We are truly blessed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now let's all turn to our neighbors. Bless them with your beautiful, good Sunday morning greeting. And after that, turn your eyes on the screen for the announcements. God bless everyone. Amen. Good morning, Gateway. Happy Sunday and welcome to church. As usual, it's another great day to be in God's house. Good for you for making the decision to get up and get to church today. If you're a guest with us, we want to extend a Gateway welcome to you. It is our pleasure to have you joining us in the service today. And our prayer is that you feel so welcomed and at home in the service. If you are that guest, we'd love if you do us a favor and fill out what we call a Connect card. You can find one of those cards under the seat in front of you or on the table at the back of the auditorium. Simply fill it out and drop it in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. And if you are a first time guest with us, we have a special small gift that we want to put in your hands before you leave church today. At the end of the service, you'll find a friendly Gateway volunteer at the table at the back of the auditorium. Simply head to them and let them know it's your first time at Gateway today. Speaking of that table at the back of the auditorium, if you're here today and you don't have a Bible of your very own, you can head to that table at the end of the service and let the Gateway volunteer know that you would love to have your very own copy of God's Word. Make sure you head to our online church calendar at gatewayonline.ca slash what's happening for everything that goes on at the church throughout the week. And while you're at it, why not give us a follow on social media so you can stay up to date there too. You can find us on Instagram at gateway.regina and on Facebook and YouTube at Gateway Church Regina. Here's a special date to mark on your calendar. On Saturday, November 4th at 9.30, we have a brand new book reading connect group starting. This book reading will be reading Destined to Reign Anniversary Edition by Pastor Joseph Prince. So the more the merrier, we'd love to have you come out and join this book reading starting Saturday, November 4th. If you want to join, please sign up at the info desk today. A little less than two weeks until Ideas Conference, so that means you have two weeks to register for one of the best weekends of the year here at Gateway. We are so looking forward to Ideas Conference happening October 27th to 29th right here at Gateway. At this conference, we are going to grow our wisdom in finances. We are going to be given some God ideas on how to have financial stability and creativity with our finances. We don't want anyone to miss out on Ideas Conference, so make sure you're registering today following the service at the ideas table in the center area you can register by paying cash or card you know at ideas conference we are blessed with some outstanding speakers who have knowledge in finances and the blessing of the Lord on their lives so what more could you ask for that is a dynamic combination we are excited to have Wally at from right here at Gateway bringing his financial advice to us. Also, we have Demi Laron from right here at Gateway who is bringing advice to us. And then we are excited to have our good friend Jorge Torres coming from Winnipeg. He is a dynamic speaker and he is gonna bring the goods as well. So this is gonna be a great weekend. We encourage you all to sign up today and also to spread the word on social media, share our ads and invite friends to join you for this great weekend here at Ideas Conference. See you there. Last Sunday, we had our big thanks day offering, and we are so thankful to each and every one of you that contributed. The figures are still coming in. We have some that are still wanting to donate this weekend, but we can already let you in on the secret that we have raised a great amount that will help bless people's lives here in the city of Regina through Souls Harbor Rescue Mission. So next Sunday, we will update you with the grand total, but thank you, Gateway, for being the hands and feet of Jesus and spreading his love right here in Regina. Thank you, Gateway, for supporting our vision of pointing people to Jesus and celebrating changed lives. When you bring your tithes into the local church, we are able to do just that, celebrate changed lives, keep our church doors open here in Regina, support local missions, and support missions overseas. So thank you, Gateway, for your obedience to God's word and bringing your tithe into the local church. There's three ways that you can continue to give today. The first is by giving in person. You can drop your giving in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. The second way to give is by heading online to gatewayonline.ca slash give and following the prompts to give by card or PayPal. And the third way to give is by text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's on the screen right now and follow the prompts. 
That's all I got for you today, Gateway. So have a great week. We look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. But here's your reminder to be an inviter this week and to invite someone to join you for church to sit in that seat beside you next Sunday morning. Now, Pastor Brian, over to you for today's message, Why Spy? All right, good afternoon, Gateway. So good to have you here. How many of you are ready to absorb the Word of God. Come on, just turn to your neighbor right now and say, I'm a sponge. <laughs> you know, it was Mark Twain who said that every sermon should have a good introduction and a good conclusion, and the two should be as close together as possible. But, but Mark Twain is not here this afternoon to be the preaching police, and so we're going to get into the Word and see what happens. Come on, would you stand with me? And would you boldly repeat after me, I love God, therefore I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow His example. See, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Come on, can you say amen? Let's give it up for Jesus. Yeah, he is Lord over his church. He's on duty. He's in the house, and he wants to speak to us today. You may be seated, and just a quick word to those who are watching online. We especially welcome you, but I got to tell you, we forgive you for not gracing us with your presence in person today. I cannot guarantee that we won't let somebody else sit in your seat. You know how that works, right? First come, first serve. But all of you watching online, we're really glad to have you joining us as well. So what we have this morning uh, or this afternoon and then again next Sunday is a two-part mini-series. The title, of course, as Rebecca already mentioned, it's called Why Spy? And some of you know the back in the history of Israel. There's a very famous story, or maybe the word is an infamous story, but uh, there certainly is a well-known story about sending spies into enemy territory. See, the nation of Israel had, had spent some 430 years in bondage in Egypt. They were a nation of slaves. That's not very nice. But the Lord mercifully raised up a man by the name of Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and across the Red Sea. Remember that? They went across the Red Sea on the dry ground. Phenomenal miracle. And then they camped in the wilderness for a couple of years, actually. So there they were in the desert. And during that time, wow, the Lord showed off. He demonstrated his power and his mercy with some just amazing miracles. Remember? the miracle of the manna and the quail and the water that gushed from the rock and there was the pillar of cloud and, and the pillar of fire by night. And you know, what more could the Lord do to, to demonstrate to the Israelites, hey, I am your God. I'm powerful. I'm working on your behalf. There isn't anything that I cannot do, just like that song we were singing a few minutes ago. But God's plan the whole time was that Israel would move in and take possession of the promised land. Everybody say, the promised land. Yeah, it's the land that the Bible says is flowing with milk and honey. It's the land that we call Israel as of this day. And, and, and so with that background in mind, let's read from the book of Numbers. So you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers, the fourth book of the Bible. And we're reading from Numbers chapter 13. And this is where Moses and company are, are right on the doorstep of the promised land. I mean, they're ready to go in and take possession of what God has promised to them, but not quite that quick. Let's see what it says to us here in Numbers chapter 13. Beginning in verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites, my gift to you. This is, this is exactly what God wants. He wants his people to occupy this really blessed piece of land. And he says, from each ancestral tribe, so there were 12 tribes in Israel. So from each of the tribes, send one of its leaders. 
to form this spy team. Verse 3, so at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. They were influential men. And so what follows is a list of the names of the 12 that were on that, that team. So Moses sends these spies over to Canaan to, to check it out, you know, to, to, to check for the lay of the land, as we say. And, and this whole message today begs the question, why spy. Everybody say, why spy? Yeah, glad you asked that. As we read on, what we will find is that to a large degree, Moses answers that question when he gives these 12 men a briefing session before he sends them off on this, this mission. All right, let's read what Moses told them, keeping in mind the question, why spy? Why spy out the land? Verse 17 of chapter 13. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and, and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled cities or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? And do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land because it just happened to be the season for first ripe grapes. Then it, it proceeds to list some of the other places that they investigated in their travels. And we pick it up again in verse 23. When they reached the valley of Eshcol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them, not two of the grapes, but two of the men carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs. You've got to envision this. Think about this. This is, this is a picture of a single cluster of jumbo grapes suspended on a pole between the shoulders of two full-grown men. That place was called the, play, the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes that the Israelite cut, Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days when they were finished their, their spy assignment, they returned from exploring the land. You see, if you read the entire chapter, you, you will find that it repeatedly uses the term explore. Everybody say explore. Yeah, well, at, at least this is the word that we find in the NIV. The New International Version talks about they were exploring, exploring, exploring. Several times that word comes up in this chapter. And, and it's true that, that they were sent to explore the land. That's a nice way of putting it. But come on, for the purpose of this teaching session today, can we call it what it is, as most of the translations do? Folks, you know as well as I, they were not just exploring, they were spying out the land, and with great stealth, I might add. Oh yeah, they were spies. You see, this is what we call a reconnaissance mission. It's a fact-finding excursion. They were gathering top secret intelligence, right? They were, they were collecting samples of resources. They were doing surveillance of enemy territory. So exploring, yes, it's true to say that they were exploring. Messengers, yeah, as one of the translation calls them, they were messengers. They had this, this God-given and Moses-given assignment to report back to the others. What is this land like? And so they were messengers, they were explorers, but let's be perfectly honest, this is nothing less than flying under the radar espionage. Yeah, they were downright sneaky. You understand, their plan was to come back later with all of their Israelite buddies, and they were going to lay claim to this land. They're going to actually take possession of this territory and drive out the current occupants of the land, the inhabitants, as the Bible calls them. Oh, they were spies, all right. These were no tourists. And when they left Canaan, when they finished their, their spy game, they didn't leave by way of the main border crossing on the main highway. Hey, where do you think you're going with that fruit? You can't take grapes across the border. No, no, they didn't go through that border crossing. They went cross country. Folks, these are spies. 
They're probably wearing camo. So what happened when they returned from this adventure? Let's pick it up again. In verse 26, it says, They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly, and they showed them the fruit of the land. It's kind of like they came back and said, Well, we have good news and we have bad news. Which do you want first? They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it's true, it does flow with milk and honey, and here's the proof. Here is the fruit of the land. But here comes the bad news. The people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. In other words, giants. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and and the Amorites, they they live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. And and, and Caleb, he was one of the spies. He's one of the good guys. He didn't like the tone of what he was hearing from his colleague, his fellow spy. And so he interrupted. Verse 30, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, wait a minute. We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people that we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Obviously, these guys haven't seen the grasshopper over on Albert Street. (laughs) See, See the ten. There's two came back with a faith-filled report. We can do this. But there was 10 of them said, nay, we're not going in there. We'll get crushed like bugs. I tell you, those 10, they should have listened to Wally's message from a couple of weeks ago. Courage for new territory, right? Folks, try to imagine the tension that was in the air, the backlash that Moses is now dealing with. Wow, they're they're choosing up sides. They're they're arguing in the camp. Well, we should go and take this land that God has for us. No, we shouldn't. Are you kidding? Wow, it gets worse in chapter 14, verse 1. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All that you could hear them. You hear the weeping in the tents. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, which means they were grumbling against the Lord. And the, and, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Wow. Yeah, Let, Let's go back and 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 just humble ourselves and ask Pharaoh if we can please have our jobs back building bricks for him. Are you kidding me? Come on. After the the, the trouble that the Lord went to to rescue you out of Egyptian bondage. Like how short is your memory? They're talking this way. Verse 5, then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, they were the two guys who brought back a report and said, come on, let's do this. The Lord's with us. So Joshua and Caleb, who were among those who explored the land, they tore their clothes. That means they were real upset. And they said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land that we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. Come on, everybody say, exceedingly. Exceedingly. Folks, we're talking about a group of people. All they've ever known is Egypt. All they've ever known is poverty. They've never known what it is to visualize the lap of luxury. 
And that's exactly what the Lord had predetermined that they should enjoy. He said, I want to welcome you into the promised land. It is a land so rich in resource. That's my will for you. That's my good pleasure for you. They had never dreamed of living in such blessing. Wow. See, these guys are speaking up, and they're making their opinion felt. They're, they're saying, this land that we explored, wow, it is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel. Come on, you guys, don't rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. And everybody should have been on their faces before the Lord. They should be saying, yeah, you are so right. What you say, Joshua and Caleb, makes so much sense. We repent of our attitude of talking about going back to Egypt. Come on, let's, let's gear up and let's get ready to go in and receive our inheritance from the Lord. That's what they should have been saying. But incredibly, the following verse says, but the whole assembly, in response to what Joshua and Caleb, the appeal that they were making to them, their response was, they talked about stoning them. Stoning who? Joshua, Caleb, Moses, Aaron, the Lord? <laughs> Gee. So you got these two voices of faith, Joshua and Caleb, and then you got these ten voices of reckless discouragement. Fear mongering, the grasshopper complex. Oh, we don't dare go in that land. There's giants in that land. What are you talking about? God is with us. Haven't you noticed some of the phenomenal, incredible, wonderful things that the Lord has done for us? Our God can do anything like we were singing earlier. Folks, this is, this is where I want you to listen very carefully. If you've been around Christian circles for any length of time, no doubt you've heard some preaching from, from the 13th and 14th chapters of, of the book of Numbers, and, and we've often preached about the difference between faith and doubt and fear. And that's a very valid lesson to take away from, from these chapters. But today, I want you to see it from a slightly different Angle, okay, here it is. Why spy? That's the question that's on the table this afternoon. Why spy? The reason for sending a team of spies was so that the spies could do what spies do, gather intel. In that promised land, are, 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 are there walled cities or, or are the people who live there, are they nomadic people? Are they, are they living in tent villages? Because when you propose to chase people off the land, it makes a huge difference if they're living in fortified cities as opposed to living in tents. Yeah. Is it rough terrain or is it easy to travel, especially with our young ones? And, and, and make sure you bring back a sampling of, of the produce. Got to prove to us that this is, in fact, a land of, of milk and honey. And most of all, bring back a report and tell us, oh, please, tell us that it's true what we've been hearing, that this is a wonderful place to live. You see, the reason why we send spies is so that those spies can come back and tell us two things. Number one, what we're up against. And number two, what we have to look forward to. That's why we spy. So that we can make a plan of action. The reason for sending spies is so that we can figure out what's the best way for us to lay a hold of what God has for us. That's why we spy. The reason why we spy is not, I repeat, the reason why we spy is not so that we can, you know, gather that information, receive the report from the messengers, and then so that we can debate it, should we or shouldn't we? Oh, no, that's not why we send spies. Not for the purpose of debate. It's not so that we can kind of weigh the pros and cons and then, and then say, well, Lord, we're, you know, we're weighing the pros and cons here. And we're going to discuss this among ourselves. We'll get back to you, Lord, as to whether we're interested in this promised land or not. No, no, no. That's certainly not why we send spies. We, we don't send spies to spy out the land so that we can handle the situation on a democratic basis. Majority rules. 
There's 10 that are against it and two that are for it. I guess that, that pretty much settles the matter. No. A thousand times no. See, this thing's already been decided. God has already clearly told us he wants us to take possession of this land. And he has assured us that he's prepared to drive the inhabitants out of the land. End of debate. In fact, there is no debate. It's not about voting. It's not our decision to make. It's what God has for us, period. It's not about... All right, who thinks we should go in and take possession of the land? One, two, three, four. All right, who thinks we should not try to take on this project and go in and possess the land? One, two, three, four. All right, who thinks the voting process is rigged? (laughs) One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's not about voting. Listen, listen up. The whole crux of the matter, the central point of this preach today is this. When you know that the Lord has something for you, or when you know that the Lord wants to do something for you, or when you know that the Lord wants you to do something for him, when you know what the Lord wants, you don't debate it long and hard, should I or shouldn't I. You don't vote on it. Well, it seems like the Lord is in favor of this thing. And the devil is against it. I guess I have the deciding vote. Wow, I feel powerful. No, we don't vote on these things. You don't vote on it. You don't sleep on it. You don't argue over it like they did. You just go along with it. Somebody say amen. Listen, the kingdom of God is not a democracy. It is a theocracy. That means that God is our king. He's the one who rules and reigns. He's going to tell us what land we should live in. Are you good with that? Come on, everybody say, Jesus is my Lord. Now say it again like you really mean it. Jesus is my Lord. Absolutely. See, the answer to this hot debate in chapter 14 is found in the very first two verses that we read at the beginning of chapter 13. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. It doesn't say, I'm thinking about giving this land to you, but, you know, send some, send some spies in, check it out, and and, you know, when they come back, you can hear what they have to say. And, and if you, you know, if you decide as a nation that this is what you want, then, then I will go with you and I will give you. No, it doesn't say anything like that. It says this is what God has for us. He says, send these spies into the land, which I am giving to the Israelites. Man, when you know what God wants for you, just get with the program. No debate necessary. You know, if push came to shove and they actually did put it to a vote in Israel, where are we going to live? Where's our future going to be? You know, there would be three places on the ballot. One, retreat to Egypt. Two, stay right here in the wilderness. And three, take possession of the promised land. Those would be the three options on the ballot if they put it to a vote. And I'll tell you what, the majority would have voted for going back to Egypt. Yeah, they would have. We read it just a few minutes ago. I mean, absolutely unbelievable that somebody could say to the Lord, well, uh, thanks, but no thanks. We've decided we don't really want to go in and take possession of that scary land. You know, 3,468 years later, there's a war going on as we speak. That war is over. Israel's possession of that very piece of land that we call the promised land. Oh, yeah, there is war that is raging over on the other side of the world. How ironic. 
How crazy ironic that the very same piece of land that in Moses' day, Israel was saying, no thanks, we don't want to take possession of that piece of land. And now all these years later, they are tenaciously defending their possession of that same piece of land that God promised to them and eventually did give to them. And then it was taken away from them, and then, the, and then God gave it back to them in 1948. Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. Wow. You know, as, as Christians, when we think about Israel, there's a, a strange tension that we feel. On, on, the, on the one hand, you know, we, we clearly understand what it says in Psalm 122 and verse, verse 6, pray for the peace and the prosperity of Israel, of Jerusalem, not just Jerusalem, but all Israel, not just all of Israel that are in the borders of Israel, but all Jews, the world around, pray for the peace and the prosperity, the blessing of God upon the people who are Jewish. But on the other hand, we clearly understand that the unfolding of Bible prophecy in the last days tells us that nations are going to be picking on Israel. They're going to be ganging up on Israel. They, they are going to be hostile toward Israel. We see it happening. It's been happening for years now, and it's really heating up now. And, and I don't know how long it's going to take, but eventually, eventually, the nations are going to attack Israel, and Jesus is going to come back, and he is going to swiftly put an end to that issue. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. But we understand that when we see other nations being aggressive toward Israel. This is all Bible prophecy being fulfilled. And so we believe we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And yet at the same time, it's kind of weird because we, we understand that when Israel is under attack, hey, that's Bible prophecy before our very eyes being fulfilled. Whew. Let God be God. Let God be God, but I'll tell you what, in the body of Christ, we stand with Israel in her hour of distress and anguish. Come on, church, we bless Israel. We love Israel. We pray for Israel. That's a good place to say amen. amen. All right, back to our story. The spies and, and the congregation, they're arguing over the promised land or not. And finally, God was so fed up with the discussion that they were having when the spies got back that, that he said, all right, all right. He said, listen, if you read the rest of chapter 14, you, you, you hear God saying, listen, if you don't want this promised land, okay, then you're not going to get it, at least not, not, not those of you that are 20 years old and more. Spoiler alert. He said, this generation will never taste of the milk and honey of that land. Everyone that is 20 years of, of age and up, you're going to be wandering in the wilderness for the next 40 years. One year of wilderness wanderings for every one day that the spies checked out the land. With the exception of Joshua and Caleb, Everybody 20 and older, your carcasses are going to fall in this wilderness. That's, that's the verdict that the Lord set down. And he said, 40 years from now, the next generation is going to have another opportunity to go in and take possession of the land. And honey, you, you can be sure they did. They learned well from the mistakes of mom and dad. So, but these that were 20 years of age and up, they became desert dwellers for the next 40 years, wandering around in circles. Now, some of you might be familiar with what's known in theology as typology. Ever heard of typology? If not, you're about to. Basically, typology is a study of people, places, and events back in the Old Testament that are like a symbolic picture, a foreshadowing, or a, a prophetic preview of some of the New Testament truths about Jesus and about the church. Now listen very carefully. When you think about what typology is, this story about Moses and Israel exiting Egypt and then heading for the promised land, this is a type. Okay, This, this is a symbolic picture of you and I. So Egypt is symbolic of living in the world system, the bondage you know, of living under Pharaoh slash Satan. 
And then the Red Sea crossing, that's symbolic of our salvation experience. And then the the wilderness slash desert experience, that's symbolic of, yes, we are a Christian, we are saved, we are God's people, but but frankly, we're settling for less than, than what God has for us. And then, of course, the promised land, that is symbolic of the the victorious Christian life, the the blessed Christian life, as we, by faith, go after all that the Lord has for us. You see, when we make that personal decision to believe and receive Jesus as our Savior, when we are awakened spiritually to the fact that, hey, I need a Savior, and Jesus is the only Savior that there is. And the Son of God came to the earth to die on that wicked cross. Not because he did anything wrong, but because he was being a sacrificial lamb. He was taking the blame for all of the sins of all humanity so that we could be off the hook if we would simply regard what Jesus accomplished for us with his death and resurrection. If we put our faith in him, the Father says, that's good enough for me. He's so ready to let us off the hook reinstate us in his family and we can experience this this thing called spiritual rebirth and then the Lord begins to renew our mind and wow it's a whole new life to live it's a fresh new start following Jesus is about the most important decision we ever make in our entire life when we choose to to follow Jesus man there's all kinds of of New Testament truths that kick in there's lots to learn and and, and the Lord wants to engineer some uh, some remarkable changes in our character and in our lifestyle and wow it's all good when when you, when you get on board with with Jesus somebody say amen But listen to me, as we walk with the Lord, we become increasingly aware of what the Lord wants for us. Or could I put it this way, where does he want us to live? Now, by that, I don't mean it's going to be Regina, Moose Jaw, Saskatoon, Vancouver. Where does the Lord want me to? No. What I'm talking about is, does he want me to live in Egypt or in the wilderness or in the promised land? Well, one thing is for sure. Egypt is not an option. Just turn to your neighbor right now and say, don't even think about backsliding. We are not going back to Egypt, which, you know, which represents where we were at before somebody kindly introduced us to the saving grace of Jesus. Forget about Egypt. We're not going there. So, so what it comes down to is, what's it going to be? Wilderness or the promised land? As far as I'm concerned, it's a no-brainer. You see, the difference between living the Christian life in the promised land as opposed to living the Christian life in the wilderness is kind of the difference between, well, I know what the Lord wants for me, and so I'm going to act on it right away. Or living the Christian life in the wilderness is it's like, well, I, I know what, what the Lord wants for me, but I, I kind of don't want to do that. I, I, I've got some other plans. Yes, I am a child of God, but I'm really not prepared to, you know, to, to get that invested in the, the, you know, the revealed will of God, that I'm ready to just you know, go, go after it and say, Lord, all that you have for me, I want it. Come on, how many of you moms and dads have ever found yourself saying to your son or daughter, honey, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you to clean up your room. You see, when you, when you know in your heart what, what the Lord wants for you, what he's asking of you, what he's requiring of you, or it wouldn't be too strong to say that, that scriptural language would be to say, say what, what the Lord is commanding of you. When you know what God wants for you, for goodness sake, don't vote on it, act on it. Someone says, well, you know, Pastor, I, I realize that I should be going to my recovery meetings, but we took a vote. We took a vote. Who took a vote? Well, me, myself, and I. The three of us each had a vote, and we took a vote, and it was unanimous, and I, and I feel it's not really necessary for me to go to those recovery meetings because I, I, I pretty much think that I've got this under control, and I can manage my addiction. Are you kidding me? You need to go to those meetings. You know that the Lord wants you to go to those meetings. You, you know what Sunday morning church is? It's going to a recovery meeting. That's what it is. I've, I've told people for years, church is a recovery meeting. Yes, it is. <laughs> 
Unanimous? We took a vote. No, don't vote on it. Folks, we've made things optional that the Lord never intended should be optional. One of the most obvious examples of that, of course, is exactly what we're doing right here, right now, this afternoon. We showed up. We, we, we got ourselves ready, and we got ourselves in the house of God. It's the Lord's day. What, what, what better activity than to come together and, and worship Jesus? I say, good for you. It's so smart. What a smooth move found in the house of God on any given Sunday. That is so excellent. Do you remember the story about the, the woman who, you know, she came to the Lord. Somebody led her to Jesus. She's born again. She starts going to church. Next thing, she's getting on her husband. Honey, you got to come to church with me. You, you would love it. And he's dragging his feet. Oh, sweetheart. No, no, no. I, I do not want to do church. That's, it. That's not me. She said, how about this? How about we flip a coin? If it's heads, you come with me to church. If it's tails, you can stay home if you want. Oh, all right. He's thinking, I got a 50% chance here. So they flipped the coin, and what do you know? It was head. So he went with her to church. The following week, she said, let's flip the coin again. He's thinking, well, by the law of averages, probably I'll get to stay home this week. But they flipped the coin. It was heads again. The third week, heads. The fourth week, heads. Several weeks later, it's heads every week. He keeps following his wife to church every week. What's going on here? He said later, he said, it was six months before I figured out that she was using one of those coins from the novelty shop. It's got heads on both sides. <laughs> but by then it was too late because I, he said, I already gave my heart to the Lord and now I was already enjoying church. I acquired a taste for Jesus. And I say, good for you. You know, every Saturday night, I have a prayer meeting. I mean, it's just me and Jesus, but that's enough to constitute a meeting, right? I meet with the Lord, and that's one of the most special times of the week for me. I just love getting before the Lord on Saturday night, but I, I have to tell you, being real candid with you right now, hardly a week goes by that during that particular prayer time on Saturday night that I don't, I don't go down a certain track and begin to pray. And I'm praying for every household in the entire Gateway family. I'm coming against strife. I'm coming against argument. I'm coming against some, some, some of that debate. Honey, are we going to church tomorrow? No, I got something else to do. Oh, come on, I want to go. Well, I don't want to go. If you want to go, go. I'm not going. I come against that. I pray for peace. I pray for unity. I pray for agreement. I pray that there's no debate, that there's no arguing, but there, there's just a heart-to-heart a -heart saying, yeah, let's go to church tomorrow. That's exactly what we should do. Oh, yeah. I pray Psalm 122, verse 1. Oh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And I just declare that word of God over every gateway household. You know, there are some of you that are here this afternoon, actually about 40% of our entire Gateway family, that, that Saturday night strife, that's a foreign thing to you. Yeah, why? <laughs> because you're already in the groove of going to church week after week after week. That's what pastors across the map call every Sunday Christian. Man, if that's you. 40% of our gateway family, if that's you, you know, you're just, you're just here every week. You're here every week. You don't, you don't debate it. You, you, you don't even think about, you know, are we going to church tomorrow, honey? No, that question doesn't even come up. It's just automatic. Of course we're going to church. We always go to church. We're Christians. It's Sunday. We go to church. That's how we do. That's who we are. Man, if that's you, I say God bless you. God bless you. Oh, may the blessing of the promised land be all over you, and may the giants of the land flee far away from you. I say, good for you. Good for you. Because obviously, that, that's exactly what the Lord wants for every one of us. Man, the weekend rolls around. Now, now I get it. There's an extenuating circumstance. There's some reason why some weeks some people are not able to be in church. I, I, I totally understand that. But except for some of those very real reasons for not being here. Oh, my goodness. I know that the Lord wants me to be in his house on any 
given Sunday. Yeah. Folks, whether it be showing up on a Sunday morning to worship God with my fellow believers or, or whether it has to do with my personal prayer life or whether it has to do with the matter of tithing and honoring the Lord with my finances or whether it's got something to do with sharing my faith with a certain individual that I just know. I just know the, the Holy Spirit's been on my case about this. There's an individual in my workplace and I need to reach out to them. They're going through some struggles and I should be telling them about Jesus. Jesus, I should be inviting them to church. I don't know why I haven't done it yet. Maybe it has something to do with sharing your faith, or, or maybe it's got something to do with utilizing your God-given gifting so that you can serve, so that you can volunteer, so that you can be used of the Lord in a meaningful way. Whatever the issue is, the point is this. When you know that God has something that He wants for you or wants you to do, don't debate it. Just do it. Somebody say amen. Yeah, it comes down to this. Why spy? Why spy? Why do we spy out the land? Not so that we can, you know, check it out, see what's involved, and, and, and then discuss it and think about it and talk about it and then, and then shoot down the Lord's idea. And God's idea, hey, I got this promised land. I would love nothing more than for you to occupy this promised land. Well, I've taken a good, hard, long look at that, Lord, and I'm saying, no thanks. What? Bite your tongue. It's like like the words of that song that the, the worship team sang this morning. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Come on, not a true word. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Lord, you want me to have that promised land. I'm following you right on into that promised land. I know we can do this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Who leads me into all that God has ordained for me? Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, let's, uh, let, let's, uh, let's not go there. You know that old, well, you know about this promised land deal, Lord? I think I'll just pass on that. No. The reason why we spy is not so that we can then make a decision. Well, I'm either going to adopt this promised land thing or I'm going to reject this promised land thing. No. The promised land is a given. It's a given. It's given to us by the Lord, but it's a given. There's no debate necessary. The promised land is a given. The reason why we send spies in the land is not so that we can take a vote when they get back. The reason why we send spies into the land is so that we can have the information available to us so that we can receive revelation from the Lord so that we can make a plan. What's the best course of action by which we can fully take possession of everything that the Lord intended for us to have? That's why we send spies, so that we can make a plan, so that we can get aligned with the God's plan, God's plan, so that we can have a strategy that works. And that's where we're going next Sunday afternoon. Part two of this series, we're talking about why we send the spies so that we can strategize. That's exactly why. Not so that we can vote. That's crazy. That's nonsense. Years ago, we used to sing this little song. We sang it over and over and over again until it got right down in our spirit. The song goes like this. He did not bring us out this far to take us back again. He brought us out to take us into the promised land. Though there be giants in the land, I will not be afraid. He brought us out to take us in to the promised land. You understand, we'd sing that over and over and over again until we believed it and until we were prepared to get our best shoes on and get out there and walk it out. Like the Lord said, everywhere you go in that land, I'm going to give you possession of it. Get your boots on. Do you know where that song comes from? That song comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 23. Let's wrap wrap it up on this note. Deuteronomy 6, 23. But he... Brought us out. God brought us out from there, from Egypt, to bring us in and give us the land that He promised on oath to our fathers. He brought us out from there to bring us in and give us this awesome land. 
the one that he promised on oath to our forefathers. Yeah, God promised Abraham that he would give the promised land to the people of Gateway. And we ought to be, I receive it. I receive it. I receive it, Lord. I believe that I'm living in and enjoying the promised land and encouraging others around me to also get in on all the benefits of this land. Come on, would you stand with me this afternoon for every one of us? I assure you, I, I'm giving you a pastor's guarantee for every one of us in this room without exception for all of us. There will be situations in the days ahead, in the weeks ahead, in the months ahead, Maybe in the years ahead, I don't know how long we have until Jesus comes back. But for as long as we have, I assure you, all of us will have numerous times when we will know very well. I'm talking deep down inside. You just know this is what the Lord wants for me. It might be an event that he wants you to attend. It might be a task that he wants you to take on as an assignment. It might be a relationship in your life, and he wants you to handle it way differently than you have been. But whatever the situation is, there's going to be times for all of us when we just know this is what the Lord wants me to do. This is what the Lord wants me to receive. This is what the Lord wants me to, by faith, go after. It seems difficult. It seems like there might be some giants hanging around the finish line. But in Jesus' name, if you know, if you know that this is exactly what the Lord has for you, what he wants you to do, it's not about debate. It's not even open for debate. It's just about act on it. Don't vote on it. Do not debate within yourself. You know how that works. That wrestling match, that tug of war going on inside of our soul. I know that the Lord wants me to do this, but I don't want to. Do not debate with yourself. Do not debate with your spouse or with your kids. Do not have that debate. End that debate and say, we're doing what we know the Lord wants us to do. That's it. Don't, don't have a debate with the Lord. Do not argue with God. You ever argue with God? Oh, Spirit of the Lord, I know, I know that you want me to step out in faith and do this, but I can't, I can't, I can't. Lord, yes, I can. I know I can. All right. Okay, Lord. You're not going to win any arguments with the Lord. Do not debate internally. Do not debate in your household. Certainly do not argue with the Lord. It's all about knowing what the Lord wants for me and getting with the program. Yes, sir, I'll get right on that. I'm all in. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody in agreement? You ought to be saying amen. Yeah, come on. Everybody say, I received the promised land. Come on, say it again. I received the promised land. Say, praise the Lord for the promised land. I believe it. I receive it. I thank God for the promised land. That's exactly where the Lord wants me to live out the rest of my life, in the promised land. I am not living in the wilderness, not another day in my life. I reject that wilderness, and by faith, I receive God's best for my family in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say, praise the Lord. This is the time for you to raise up your hands and raise up your heart and raise up your voice and offer some praise. I believe that there's a, a power of God released among us that our giants are, are fleeing away from us in every direction as we praise the name of the Lord and say, thank God the promised land belongs to me in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody give praise to the Lord. Clap your hands, wave your hands, or do something to say, oh, Oh God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I'm spying out the land so that I can figure out how to take possession of the land. That's why we spy. Not so that we can, you know, bang our heads together and say, are we going to do this? No, I don't think so. No, me neither. No. We do not ever shoot down the plans of the Lord. Whatever's on God's drawing board, man, we get in agreement with it. Somebody shout amen course we do. 
All right, we're going to pick it up again next Sunday and, and, and talk some more about going into the land. We're going to talk about what happened 40 years later. That was a completely different scenario. But we're going to, we're going to find out what's God's strategy for us. How we take possession of what belongs to us. Amen. Come on, before we go our separate ways from church today, let's pray the prayer of salvation. We can't leave church without affirming that God is our Savior. Listen, there might even be individuals here today, in person or watching online, if you've never truly turned your life over to Jesus to say, Lord, it's about time that I get on with seriously being a born-again Christian. Lord, I really want to follow you. If you don't know for sure that you're saved, if you want to dedicate yourself to the Lord, first time, or maybe a recommitment. In a moment, we're all going to pray this prayer together, but first, with every head bowed, every eye closed in this personal moment of commitment. My friend, if you know that you need to seriously commit yourself to Christ, cross the room, those watching online, just raise your hand wherever you are. Just raise your hand if you know I need to do this. Yes, I see your hand in the center section. Thank you. You can put it down. Are there others? Who else? This is your day to say, Lord, count me in. I must do this. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? All right, come on, church. Let's pray this prayer and affirm together where we stand with Jesus. Let's all pray this. Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for your kind gift of salvation. Of course I receive your saving grace and the promised land that comes with it. Jesus, I know you're the Son of God. I know you died on that cross to deal with my sin. I know you rose from the grave to give me a new start. So I ask you to forgive me for all I've ever done wrong. Cleanse me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live the Christian life in the promised land. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on. Somebody give the Lord some praise. He deserves it. Thank you for watching today's Church Online. We pray that today's worship and message was so encouraging to you. Hey, if you live in Regina or if you're ever in the Regina area and you've never joined us for church, we would love to see you here one Sunday in person. Remember, there are two services for you to take part in. One is at 9.30 or 11.30. We'd love to see your smiling face here. If that's not possible, we'll see you right back here next Sunday for Church Online.